to explore your spirit with Kayla. Journey with Kayla as she speaks with researchers, artists, teachers and healers, delving into topics of ancient mysteries, metaphysical explorations and new discoveries from science and spiritual arenas. Explore Your Spirit with Kayla can be found online at exploreyourspirit.com. Visit the website for more podcasts, articles, metaphysical news and upcoming events. Welcome to Explore Your Spirit. I'm your host, Kayla. Our special guest this evening is nuclear physicist and lecturer Stanton Friedman, who has distilled more than 40 years of research on UFOs and shares his work on a wide variety of classified advanced nuclear and space systems. His new book, Flying Saucers in Science, presents intriguing data from a number of large-scale scientific UFO studies and deals with a host of why questions, such as reasons for the cover-up, reasons for aliens to come to Earth, and reasons for not landing on the White House lawn. Friedman unveils the SETI program and details the antipathy of science fiction writers to UFOs and other mysteries of the saucer conundrum. Welcome, Stan, to the show. Glad to be on. Such a pleasure to have you here on Explore Your Spirit, and really excited about your book. Of course, you've done more research than anyone I know in this field, and it's a legend, and I have to tell you that my husband is your biggest fan. I think this is the <laughs> show he's most excited about that I've ever done. <laughs> well, good. Good. And, hey, I've been around longer than most people, <laughs> after all. <laughs> well, you have such a, a, a brilliant way of looking at this, though, and getting the facts out there, and of course, with your physics background, and I have a special affinity for anyone in physics, because I think it's the science that's the closest connection to really uh, understanding the greater mysteries, because I, I know a lot of scientists, but those in physics are willing to explore and go where others won't go sometimes and, and seem to understand uh, the world through different eyes. And I really appreciate and respect that about you, about your colleagues and you. Well, you know, one of the things about physics is how much has changed in the last hundred years, how many new things have come along not previously anticipated or explored. And so one learns to withhold judgment about what's impossible, what can't be. Uh, I think my next book is going to be, it's impossible, isn't it? <laughs> and list all the claims that were made for impossibility and then show what was wrong with them because we've accomplished them. And then go to look at the current world. What are we saying is impossible that may not be at all. Absolutely. And to me, that's good science is doing the work, investigating, but also keeping an open mind that we don't know everything and, and being able to open that it's going to change, which is inevitable. Well, you know, it's, it's amazing. Every generation of ancient academics and fossilized physicists thinks it knows all there is to know when, in fact, uh, it doesn't. And the next generation clearly demonstrates that. Yes. Uh, it's kind of fascinating to see how that happens. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the book, uh, there's a lot of discussion of this kind of thing, especially in the chapter on you can get here from there, reviewing all the <laughs> impossibilities. You know, uh, it, sometimes it's ludicrous. I mean, there's a guy calculating, an astronomer calculating the required initial launch weight of a rocket, just a chemical rocket, able to get a man to the moon and back, back in 1941. And he lots of equations. His bottom line, it would have to weigh a million, million tons. Mm. And 30 years later, we did it, less than 30 years actually, we did it with a rocket who, that weighed 3,000 tons instead of a million, million. <laughs> it's <laughs> all about, about being astronomically in error, because he, <laughs> he made all the wrong assumptions, which is the key to all this kind of thing. Yes, it's all about thinking outside the box. Yeah, yeah, you very were, much so. You're speaking about that with travel, and that's where I'd like to start. Is Could you describe for us some of uh, technology and what type of energy you think we could use to travel? Because from what I understand, you think that we do have the ability to travel much further than we currently understand right now. Oh, yeah. And the thing is that there's a basic, uh, I'll call it Friedman's Law, that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. So if we look at what we've been doing and then say, well, do we know some directions we could go that are reasonable in today's world? And when it comes to travel, well, the epitome of how not to do it 
the head of the uh, Hayden Planetarium in New York on the Peter Jennings mockumentary of February 24th, 2005. <laughs> I was interviewed for an hour. They used 20 seconds and called me a promoter twice in that period of time, which is a pretty neat job. Anyway, the astronomer says, uh, pointing out how silly it is to talk about travel to the stars, that, look, our fastest vehicle, the Voyager spacecraft, takes will take 70,000 years to get to the nearest star. Now, most scientists like to be around when their experiments conclude. Well, the kicker here is that that spacecraft hasn't had a propulsion system on it since it left Earth. It's coasting. Now, if I were to tell you, well, I can figure out how long it takes to cross the ocean, I'll throw a bottle in the ocean and see. Or how, how long does it take to fly? Well, let's put a kite up there and let's see how long it takes. As a matter of fact, we do know of techniques for going very much faster. I worked back in the 60s, mind you, on nuclear rocket engines. And why nuclear? Because there's so much more energy per pound of material. Uh, that's why we have atomic bombs. You know, uh, a small atomic bomb has the equivalent energy, like the ones we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, let's say, uh, 15,000 tons of TNT. Tons. And that's peanuts compared to my first choice, which is nuclear fusion. And fusion is something that everybody in an advanced society will understand, will know about, will try to control, because fusion is the major source of energy of the stars. Our star, the sun, is not a mass of burning gas. It's a fusion factory, if you will. Now... Back in the 60s, I worked on a nuclear fusion propulsion system. We did a study at our General Nucleonics, a small study, nine million bucks uh, for the Air Force. And what we found was that if you use the right stuff in the right way and kick particles out the back end of a fusion rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket, not 10 times, not a hundred, not a thousand, ten million times as much energy. Mm. Now, have we successfully operated fusion rockets? Probably not. They would be very expensive, and you have to decide you want to go to the stars. And I don't think we've made that decision. We haven't even made the decision to set up a base on the moon or Mars, have we? But nuclear fusion is the ideal. Now, it is interesting because it tells us a lot about we Earthlings. I'm presuming you're an Earthling, uh, just for conversation here, but uh, <laughs> uh, the uh, discovery that it was fusion that powers the stars came in 1938. Now, you understand the stars were fusioning long before we figured that out. Some people think if we don't know how something works, it can't be working, uh, hardly. Okay, that was 1938 by a physicist, Dr. Hans Bethe. Uh, it only took us 14 years to put that discovery to use. What did we do? We exploded our first H-bomb, which is a nuclear fusion device. That was in 1952. It was a relatively small H-bomb. It only had the power of 10 million tons of TNT. So do we know anything that gives us more energy than chemical rockets? Yes, of course we do. Now, I should add into the picture that one of the things I don't do is talk about going to other galaxies. I've had people say, look how much energy it would take to get to Andromeda. What do I care? It's two million light years away. Uh, within 55 light years of here, there are 2,000 stars, of which 46 are similar to the sun. Our, gal our galaxy, the Milky Way, is about 100,000 light years across, hardly the two million light years to Andromeda. Uh, it's about 15,000 or so light years thick, but it's got a couple hundred billion stars. Why in the world would I be concerned about going to another galaxy? As a matter of fact, my favorite target, Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli, two stars in the constellation of reticulum, which you can't see from here. You've got to go down the equator. It's, that means the net in Latin. Uh, they're only 39 light years away. Two to be precise. But those two stars just happen to be the closest to each other pair of sun-like stars in our entire local neighborhood. 
they also are a billion years older than the sun. Billion. That's rather a big number. And they're only an eighth of a light year apart. That means they're 35 times closer to each other, those two stars, than the sun is to the next star over. We're out in the boonies. These guys got next door neighbors. One would think, I think pretty rationally, that there's more incentive to develop techniques for interstellar between the stars and travel when you got a next door neighbor than when there ain't nobody in the neighborhood. Furthermore, with a billion year head start, one figures they've probably learned some things that we don't know because progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. And anybody who denies that, let them look back a hundred years. I got a bit of a shock. I was speaking to two college classes at the University of Detroit a couple of years back, and I was going over how much things have changed in the past 50 or so years. You know, look at your computers and microwaves and uh, satellite stuff, uh, GPS and all, DNA, all this kind of stuff. And I casually said, you know, when I started working in industry, I was using a slide rule. And I looked around the class. I got no reaction at all, so I was crazy enough to ask, any of you know what a slide rule is? Not one student in the class did, and that was only 50 years earlier. So what will we know 50 years from now, or 100, or 1,000? And incidentally, I better throw another number into the picture here. Uh, the fact that we've got a, they got a billion-year head start on us is useful, but we are not, what's the word I want here? Uh, we're just beginning our exploration. Uh, you know, give them 100 years from now, and I'll bet none of us could predict that. And, oh, the other number I wanted to throw in is, for those who worry about such things, at 1G acceleration, the force of gravity here that holds me in my chair and you in yours and accelerates you when you drop from a height, drop a ball from a height or whatever. It only takes one year at 1G acceleration to get close to the speed of light. One year. And I've had professionals guess. I give them a multiple choice test when I go to classes. 1,000 years, 100 years, 10 years, one year. And uh, many of them guess 1,000 years or 100 years, 10 years. It's only one year. So now people keep will tell you loudly, hey, Einstein says the faster you can go to the speed of light. Friedman, you're a physicist. Don't you believe in Einstein? Sure I do, but I don't believe in half an Einstein. He also said, as you get close to the speed of light, time slows down for things moving that fast. How much? Well, it depends on how fast you go. At a mere 99.99% of the speed of light, and we physicists make particles that go faster than that, more nines, in big accelerators. But at just 99.99, it only takes six months to go about 39 light years. That's pilot time. You go out, come back, marry your grandchild's best friend, etc. It's a gift of immortality. So what I'm trying to say is we're not in the wilderness. We know enough to say that we know of techniques that would do the job. And, of course, we use cosmic freeloading. I like that phrase somehow. All our deep space probes, we use the gravitational kick from one planet to get us to the next one kind of thing. And find a convenient black hole and let it do the work. Don't get too close. Might be a little dangerous. But uh, So what I'm saying is in the real world, we know what steps we could take. We certainly know what steps others could take. And if you live long enough, we'll see all this happening. I mean, would anybody believe that you, 50 years ago, that you could transmit uh, something like U2 does all the time over just a phone line? You know, a movie. Yes. That's incredible. At least I think it is. It is. I'm so fascinated by the telephone and how it works, Stan, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell me, you mentioned we're in the boonies. Uh, but even people go to visit the boonies, and I believe, as you believe, that, that we have uh, people here visiting. Would, would that be yes. a right to put it? And so tell us about that. Who do you think's here? Who's visiting or, or who's moved in? Well, 
I don't know about moving in. I, maybe we're a penal colony. They dumped all the bad boys and girls here. And that's why we're so nasty to each other. You know, uh, you know, Australia still takes pride in the fact that they were started by convicts. So we're the Australia of the Milky Way or the universe, you're saying? <laughs> well, you know, the neighborhood. neighborhood. But no, I, I go a much further step. I mentioned Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 reticuli, these two stars, uh, that are only a billion years older than the sun. That work, the... the, the that conclusion comes from the work done on a star map seen by Betty Hill on board a saucer. This is described in last year's book, uh, uh, Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, by myself and Kathleen Marden, who's Betty's niece. And they were, uh, Betty and Barney, were taken on board a saucer in 1961, uh, September 19th, uh, in New Hampshire. Yes, I remember that story. It was fascinating. Yeah, and you know, uh, what makes it so remarkable is that the guy who did the regressive hypnosis didn't know anything about UFOs, but Dr. Benjamin Simon was an outstanding psychiatrist who had worked out techniques to help people who'd had traumatic experiences, which they would just as soon forget, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, if you will. And after the war, World War II, he actually headed a hospital for several years, Mason Hospital, I guess it was. 3,000 beds for what they used to call shell shock war veterans. So he developed techniques to help those guys. And he was more successful than anybody else had ever been. Deep hypnosis, amnesia after each session. Uh, only when they're ready do you play it back to them. Working through those traumatic experiences. <laughs> And so Betty and Barney, under hypnosis, uh, separately, weekly sessions for several months. Uh, Betty see, describes how she was shown a star map, and then a brilliant woman, Marjorie Fish, built 26 three-dimensional models of our local galactic neighborhood, and uh, out of that was able to identify all the stars in the pattern. They turn out to be all, all to be sun-like stars, which is true of only about 5% of the stars in the neighborhood at most. Uh, it turns out they're in a plane. What that means is like uh, thin slices of pepperoni on a big fat pizza, uh, as opposed to um, raisins in a big fat loaf of raisin bread, you know, in all directions. Well, when all, and the planets in the solar system are in a plane, too, incidentally. They're not helter-skelter. makes it a lot easier to travel to stay in the same so I think some of these guys are zeta reticulans. How many? I don't know. But I think it is natural to expect they'd be checking us out. Because I think they've checked us out for thousands of years. There are stories in the Bible that certainly sound like what we would call UFO sightings. Ezekiel's wheel and many references. Oh, yeah, the pillar of fire by night, you know, and the cloud by day. And there's a wonderful book uh, by Dr. Barry Downing called The Bible in Flying that gets into that. But I think things took on these, these inspection trips. Uh, the people are still primitive. You know, they're still primitive. They got sailboats. They're not flying, et cetera, et cetera. But all of that came to a sudden, uh, a real abrupt c conclusion. You see, uh, background here, I make one assumption about every advanced civilization. I think it's concerned about its own survival and security. Everybody we know, that's their primary concern, isn't it? That means you've got to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood, yes. primitives meaning us, but only close tabs when your primitives show signs of being able to bother you. Mm. There were three signs at the end of World War II that soon this primitive society, whose major activity was obviously tribal warfare, we only killed 50 million of our own kind during World War II, which shocks a lot of the younger people, but it's true. Some say 70, but I'm very conservative, so I say only 50 million. But there were three signs to these guys or gals that soon earthlings would be moving out, probably taking their brand of friendship, which everybody else describes as hostility, <laughs> out there. I mean, how, what else can you say about us? We destroyed 1,700 cities during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were three signs. One was atomic bombs. They leave junk in the atmosphere in places that are highly radioactive that can't be produced any other way, really. 
second was rockets, the V-2 rockets, which Germany was using to bomb England. They weren't sending a mail that way, although that's a possible use of a rocket, but uh, they were bombing. And the third was what I would call electronics. Before the war, there was no radar. Uh, and suddenly we were developing sophisticated techniques for producing radio waves, uh, television waves, you know, FM radio, all kinds of stuff. You put those all together and they say, oh, these guys are going to be pestering us pretty quick. A hundred years, which is nothing on a cosmic time scale, I think. And I find it's no coincidence at all that the only place on planet Earth in July 1947 where you could study all three of these technologies was southeastern New Mexico. The first nuclear weapon was exploded on the grounds of the White Sands Missile Range, Trinity Site, it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where we were testing a couple of years later the captured German V-2 rockets. And that's where we had our best radar to track the rockets because, uh, unfortunately, sometimes they didn't go where they were supposed to go. There were actually some that went south instead of north where they were supposed to go. The Mexicans weren't happy about that. Incident. Now, admittedly, when I went through this little uh, scenario, an English astronomer very haughtily said, well, they could have gone to the Soviet Union. No, they didn't test their first day bomb until August 1949, two years after Roswell. So what I'm trying to say is that while there may be, and in the book I think I supply 25 different reasons for coming to planet Earth, Certainly one would be to make sure we don't take off for another uh, solar system before we get our act together. In other words, we've got a lot of technology and not enough sociology. And to me, the proof of that sort of simple-minded, but every single day, at least 30,000 children die needlessly of preventable disease and starvation. Yesterday, today, tomorrow, etc. And yet, this year, the United States alone will spend half a trillion dollars on things military, and the rest of the world, another half a trillion dollars. Now, how does that look to somebody who's got some sense? You know, as I mentioned, the first thing we did with fusion was an H-bomb. The fireball in 1952 was three miles wide. What do you suppose the aliens thought about that? <laughs> you know, what are these idiots doing, I think, would be one of the things they think about it. It is really sad in that our technology only seems to develop and grow when it's for war. Even the Internet that we love was originally yeah. for that capacity. Everything is. And it doesn't say much about us of us as a society that the only time we seem to evolve or head in that direction is in defense or trying to disturb someone else. Yeah, that's a very sad commentary. It's true. And so I try to bring that into my lectures to get people to, as Bobby Burns said, you know, to see ourselves as others see us. Uh, it's pretty obvious when you look around the planet. And uh, it's disturbing. Yes. Uh, and speaking of... We don't pay attention enough to that. I, I completely agree. I wanted to ask you about Roswell with, of course, the, yeah, everyone knows about Roswell and the ship. Do you think that was one ship and those were scouts and they just crashed and there were lots of others around monitoring and others visiting at the same time, but that was just, they well, just had a I, problem on their ship and crashed? I, a point I make in the book is that my vision of how all this is going on is that we have these huge motherships. There are some excellent sightings of vehicles that are, believe it or not, half mile to a mile long. It's enormous. Uh, they're, they're not right down near the ground, incidentally. They're not the ones that land. Uh, a guy named Ted Phillips is 4,000 physical trace cases from 70 countries. These are cases where the saucer is seen indeed on or near the ground. Uh, one of the six of the cases involve reports of being seen with the saucer. And when they leave, they leave physical changes, not crop circles, but burn circles, burn rings, landing gear marks, et cetera. So uh, they're there. but And those are usually small, 20 to 40 feet in diameter. But I think that between the stars, which is a very good vacuum and not much going on, they use these huge motherships. But when you're near a planet, being able to go near the speed of light doesn't do you much good. It takes a seventh of a second to go around the planet. Uh, you know, how do you meet somebody for lunch at that kind of speed? <laughs> uh, and so I think 
the situation is very much analogous to our nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. These are huge, quarter mile long anyway, and the nuclear-powered ones can run for about 18 years without refueling, which is a pretty neat trick, and they carry about 75 small airplanes, which can go a lot faster, but not on the water, and which need refueling every two or three hours. So I think we're dealing with motherships, uh, releasing a, a large number of little guys, Earth excursion modules, I call them. Remember we had the lunar excursion module and we landed on the moon? Yes. Right? And so I think what happened at Roswell, uh, probably a mid-air collision between two of them, maybe running into a radar beam we know is on because they were due to fire one of those rockets at White Sands not far away. And uh, I think that uh, one of them exploded. That's the one near the Foster Ranch, Mac Brassel's Ranch, uh, spreading small pieces of stuff all over the place in an area that Major Jesse, Jesse Marcel, who was the first military guy out there, said was uh, maybe three-quarters of a mile long, a few hundred yards wide, little pieces of stuff, and nothing conventional. He was looking for vacuum tubes for wires, propellers, you know, signs saying made in Oshkosh or whatever. <laughs> None of that kind of stuff. He'd seen airplane crashes. And the reason he thought it was a mid-air explosion because there was no crater. When an airplane goes in, it makes a big hole in the ground. So uh, Roswell, I think, was probably not the only crash. There was another one at the same time in the plains of St. Augustine, west of there. But uh, who knows whether the, the big one came back Hey, what happened to ship number 37? Oh, cripes. No more signal from them. The explosion might well have destroyed their uh, systems, their GPS and their systems for uh, communicating back to the mothership. So, uh, you know, we don't fully know what happened. The government probably does. But we're dealing with a cosmic water gate here. And in the book, I do have a couple of documents that are interesting, a CIA document that you can read eight words on, everything else is blacked out, uh, an essay document, I got uh, over 100 pages of those where everything has been whited out, they didn't like my showing blacked out documents on television, so <laughs> they used white out instead, uh, but you know, one sentence per page, two sentences, oh, it's sources and methods information, they say, so why is it listed under UFOs? They're called, NS, this is NSA, National Security Agency. No such agency is the inside joke on that, or it never <laughs> says anything. <laughs> well, these you know these guys are big guys, and uh, some of the academics slay me with their thinking. You know, a big project is a dozen professors and thirty grad students. Well, uh, it's not a big project at all. The NSA is an annual black budget of estimated at ten to fifteen billion dollars a year. Billion. And when I was working on nuclear airplanes way back in 1958 at General Electric, the existence of the program was not classified. It was not a black project, but it said General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department at the door. But we were spending $100 million in 1958. That was a lot of money. That is a lot of money. I mean, uh, to me, anyway, some people may not think so, but certainly when you consider it was 1958, 50 years ago, uh, and the dollar is worth a little less now than it was then, you know. <laughs> uh, and so we had we employed 3,500 people full-time. 1,100 of them were engineers and scientists. That was one high-tech program. So, you know, I, when I did that mockumentary interview for the Peter Jennings show, after we were finished, the guy asked me, now, Stan, don't you think if these things were real... Uh, that half the scientists and universities in the country would be working on UFO-related stuff? And I said, absolutely not. If you want to build something, a stealth aircraft, a nuclear submarine, you don't go to a university. You go to industry. You go to Westinghouse or to Lockheed or McDonnell Douglas and a whole bunch of big companies out there. And, you know, on the stealth aircraft, we spent $10 billion in 10 years. It wasn't done in university. Lockheed did it. It was a little help from their friends, but still. Uh, so people have a, a sort of uh, 
inadequate perception of the world in which we live. That's one of the reasons for writing the book. Uh, I, I want to show people there's a whole bunch of data that you'll never hear about from the nasty, noisy negativists, the debunkers. Uh, and that's why there's a chapter on the cult of SETI. And boy, some people get mad at me. What do you mean, cult, Stan? They're a bunch of scientists. Well, what's a cult? It's a group with charismatic leadership, with strong dogma, strong resistance to outside ideas, and a very enlarged notion of their own importance. Sure sounds like SETI to me. It's not based on science. They assume we can tell what kind of a signal somebody out there who may be a thousand or a million years ahead of us is going to send to us. We know the technique he's going to use. Now, we don't answer the question, why would he send us a signal, this primitive society? You know, hey, guys, what are you doing for lunch? Come on. Because they assume that nobody is traveling between the stars. They assume there's no uh, colonization, no migration. Uh, That's a pretty sterile view of the neighborhood as far as I'm concerned. And they also will tell you there is no evidence for UFOs. And I, I read their books. They won't read mine. Um, maybe some of them will read my new one because it's got a whole chapter on SETI <laughs> and get mad. But anyway, uh, when you look at their books, when they bring up UFOs, they never reference the five large scale, six large-scale scientific studies that I talk about in my book. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. We're right back there with those assumptions that we talked about in the beginning yeah. that hold up science and exploration. Right on. And that's why there's a whole chapter on science fiction and science and UFOs, because I, when I was young and naive, uh, that was a long time ago, I thought that science fiction writers, I read science fiction when I was 10 or 12 years old, I had a friend who had a basement full of this stuff, and I kind of enjoyed it, I was young, uh, but I, we always thought, as I got older, I didn't get interested in flying science until I was 24, I thought, well, for sure, science fiction writers would be interested in you know, space travel and imagination and all this stuff. Well, I found much to my dismay that they weren't. They're virulently opposed. And I quote Isaac Asimov and Ben Bova and Arthur C. Clarke. And I was shocked. I went into a science fiction store in Berkeley, California. Now, what could be more liberal than Berkeley, you know? Uh, and I said uh, casually to the owner, where are your, science, your UFO books? We don't carry any of that trash. <laughs> that was his response. Like, science fiction is okay, but not this UFO nonsense. So I exposed their lack of imagination. That's the thing that surprised me the most. I would expect science fiction writers like Asimov, Bob, and Clark to be imaginative. They're not. I mean, Isaac comes up with this strange viewpoint. If aliens were visiting Earth, they would either make themselves known, I think he means talk to him, or they would hide, and if they do neither, they're not visiting. I got squirrels in my backyard. I don't talk to them very often. <laughs> I certainly don't hide from them. Sometimes they hide from me, but I guess. But we tolerate each other. You know, there's a lot of, in other words, a lot of different approaches besides hide or land on the White House lawn. There's a, a great quote I'm trying to remember that says when you are teaching something new, that first it's laughed at, then it's vehemently uh, opposed, and then finally it's viewed as self-evident, and that's where these things go. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who said that, but he was right. Uh, and Max Planck, a great German physicist, said a long time ago that new ideas come to be accepted, not because their opponents come to believe in them, but because their opponents die and a new generation grows up that's accustomed to them. Mm -hmm. He didn't say understands. He said accustomed. I mean, ask the average person uh, about television. It's no big deal. It would have been to your great-grandfather, of course. Sure. But how does it work? Well, you plug it in and turn it on. Well, it doesn't answer anything. Absolutely. You plug in a toaster, too, but it doesn't show you pictures. (laughs) Uh, You know, so... uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. There is a strong resistance to new ideas, and uh, it takes a lot of work to overcome that resistance. It's not a question of absence of evidence. It's a question of presence of ignorance and bias 
and prejudice and those other nice words that get in the way all the time. Yes, it is. We're going to take a quick break. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more with Stanton Friedman and Flying Saucers and Science. We'll be right back with more of Explore Your Spirit with Kayla. Would you like to know what guest is coming up next on Explore Your Spirit? Sign up at exploreyourspirit.com for our free monthly talk show guide to receive information on upcoming shows and events with Kayla. Imagine enjoying the best features of the Body, Mind, Spirit Expo without ever leaving home. You can this August 8th and 9th at the second annual Virtual Expo. During this amazing weekend, you can use your computer as your convention center. Best of all, it's totally free. Stop by the Virtual Expo Hall and chat with your favorite exhibitors live via text or one-to-one video. Download their brochures, sign up for newsletters, or even shop from their online store. Take some time to attend more than 60 free presentations in the virtual meeting rooms. You can see presentations from across the globe stream live to your screen. Ask questions via a chat window or just enjoy seeing the leaders in holistic thought as you never have before. Meet up with some of the other 5,000 expo attendees from across the globe in the Electronic Expo Lounge. You can chat live or through discussion threads. Don't miss this groundbreaking opportunity to experience the global holistic movement with attendees from over 30 countries. Again, it's August 8th and 9th, requires no software or downloads, and it's totally free to attend. Visit the Expo Hall today and watch a demo showing all these features at work. Browse globally, view locally, at the only virtual holistic expo on the planet, www. Dot V-B-M-S-E dot com. That's www.vbmse.com. Hi, this is Kayla, and I'm very excited to tell you that my new book, Nine Life-Altering Lessons, Secrets of the Mystery Schools Unveiled, is now available through Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, and local bookstores. Some of you know that I'm a teacher of the esoteric teachings at the School of Stella Maris, and in this book, I share nine of the lessons which are taught to students who decide to study the ancient wisdom from the mystery schools. The lessons are designed to stir the soul, awaken the mind, and reveal long-forgotten memories of past lives, as well as inspire you to explore the magnificence of who you really are. Buy your copy today and delve into lessons including Exploring the Magical Universe in Which We Reside, Alchemical Transformations of the Heart, Body, and Mind, The Hermetic Axiom, As Above, So Below, Understand the Long-Forgotten Destiny of Your Soul, Discover Universal Ancient Truths from Various Mystery Schools, and Reveal Your Various Bodies of Energy and Multidimensional Selves. More information about the book and the Temple of Stella Maris can be found at templeofstellamaris.org. Stella is S-T-E-L-L-A, Maris is M-A-R-I-S, templeofstellamaris.org. And while you're there, sign up for the free email newsletter where I answer questions from fans about the book and reveal previously undisclosed information about the book and the Mystery School teachings. My book was published by Reality Press. More information about Reality Press and Reality Entertainment can be found at reality-entertainment.com. We're back with more of Explore Your Spirit with Kayla. We're back from our break, speaking more with Stanton Friedman in his book, Flying Saucers and Science. And Stan, I wanted to ask you, I've had Nick Pope on the show, the former British Minister yeah, of Nick. Defense. And he, well, when he was on the show, we talked about that Britain is starting to loosen up and release some of their documents and let some more information out. And then last night I was watching CNN, and of all things, they showed some video uh, from Britain that was released saying that is this a UFO is how it's presented on CNN. And they showed a light circling around a helicopter and they went as far as to say, was it attacking the helicopter? Was it bothering it? What is this? And 
that at least it was on CNN and things are starting to be leaked out and I'm starting to notice that more. Do you think that it's finally uh, the governments are about to leak this out and slowly in bits like this and let people get well, accustomed to it? I think the media are starting to get more serious. Uh, I mean, I did two Larry King shows this past year and I'm going to do another one on July 18th. And, uh, you know, what they realize and it took them a long time to get around to realizing it, is that serious, sensible, thoughtful people are interested in this stuff. Yes. But I think the main reason for that was when the, the turning point, when the Chicago Tribune on January 1st, 2007, carried a front-page article above the fold, very good exposure, about the UFO sightings at uh, O'Hare Airport by United Airlines employees and where they pointed out that at first the uh, FAA said, we don't know anything about those, and then they used Freedom of Information and found, oh, yeah, we did hear about those. Anyway, the important thing is that that article in a very conservative newspaper got more hits on their website, over a million, than any other article they'd ever published about any subject. Furthermore, it led to this for four days, and the reporter, John Hilkovich, who did a fine job, but ironically, he's the transportation editor, which sounds appropriate somehow. Uh, <laughs> he got calls from all over the world to do interviews, and they actually ran a little piece, a kind of editorial piece, saying that they were shocked. They thought only a small group of people were interested in this. Obviously, that wasn't true. Well, the point is that newspapers are losing circulation, you know, the Internet and so forth. And so... The past year and a half, we've seen a lot of coverage. One of the subjects was the English Ministry of Defense. A lot of Americans are surprised to find out that freedom of information is a new thing to England. Uh, yes, we've had it for a long time, but they hadn't. And when they announced that they were going to release some materials, and some people will tell you, oh, that was highly classified. What a breakthrough. It wasn't highly classified. There's no indication that the hot stuff, if you will, ever made it out. And Nick and I talk about this, and I say, so where's the top secret material, Nick? And uh, the reason I say there must have been is that there was an article, a memo, put out by an Air Force General, Carol Bolander. He was asked to decide what we should do about Project Blue Book this back in 1969. And he had had nothing to do with it. He'd worked in the lunar excursion module and we landed successfully in July of 69. So he was asked to look at this. He was an engineer. And he recommended that Blue Book be closed because it wasn't really contributing anything, which is certainly true. Blue Book was the supposedly the only American effort concerned with UFOs. But he noted, moreover, reports of UFOs which could affect national security will continue to be made using... JNAP 146, Joint Army Navy Air Force publication, or Air Force Manual 55-11, and are not part of the Blue Book system. Two paragraphs later, he says, if we close Project Blue Book, the public won't have a place to report UFOs. However, as previously noted, reports which could affect national security will continue to be investigated in accordance with uh, regulations established for that purpose. Now, the U.S. Uh, Project Blue Book files have been available since the mid-70s. Uh, 12,000 cases, 92 reels of microfilm. Uh, people forget about that when they talk about the English stuff. But if the good stuff in the United States didn't go to Project Blue Book, why should we expect that the good stuff in England or France, which has also put a bunch of stuff on the Internet, uh, why should we expect that they would release the good stuff? And uh, incidentally, as I don't know whether it was before or after you had Nick on, but uh, they got a tremendous number of hits with this latest release of stuff to the uh, National Archives in England. Over a million people looking for stuff there. Incidentally, the big reason they put this out there is that they were spending all their time responding to Freedom of Information Act requests about UFO materials. Absolutely. And uh, they'd rather spend their time on something else. So there's no indication. Well, let me give you another example. It illustrates why I am dubious that this includes the good stuff. Uh, John Greenwald, who has a wonderful website, the 
uh, Black Vault, which has thousands of government documents uh, released under Freedom of Information. Uh, he asked the Air Force for their information about UFOs, and they said, we no longer collect such information. Uh, uh, we don't have anything. At the same time, he gets pilot manuals for the F-16, 17, 18, and they have instructions to the pilots what they should do if they see not only a surface ship or an unknown aircraft, but an unknown flying object, an identified flying object. They should make reports using those uh, instructions that I mentioned before. This is all post-2000. Oh, we don't have anything to do with UFOs. Oh, yeah, but we tell the pilots what to do if they see something. <laughs> <laughs> There's a piece on my website at www.stantonfriedman.com about government UFO lies. And I don't discriminate. Everybody's lying about UFOs. And the press hasn't done its job. I've seen no good press coverage besides Billy Cox, who's an outstanding journalist in Florida, and uh, George Knapp, who's a journalist in Las Vegas, uh, except for those two. I've seen nothing about this Bolinder memo. I mean, isn't that exciting that the good stuff didn't go to Project Blue Book? I would think so. I'll tell you what astounds me is I'm a huge historian, and I wish I think if people w were to study history more, they would really be different as a society. You look back in history when people were adventurers, and they would go to jungles in South America or continents that we hadn't even mapped at the time or countries we didn't understood, and they would come back with stories with these animals that could hardly be described or people that looked so different, and and they were told, you're, you're lying, you're making this up, where's your proof, I don't see a picture, this does not exist, until, of course that it was proved that it exists. And yet you would think each generation we would learn a little more, we would take this into account with history and go, you know, we didn't think these things existed in the ocean. We didn't think this continent existed. We didn't think these people existed. Maybe there's something to this, and just because you don't have a Polaroid or they're not posing at the Super Bowl doesn't mean that they don't exist. Right on, right on. And it's part of what we're dealing with here is ego, of course. Both scientists and journalists, and I have a whole chapter in the book about the, the press and UFOs and the lousy job they've done, both scientists and journalists would have to admit that they'd ignored, ignored the biggest story of the millennium for 60 years. It's much easier to say there can't be anything. I, I call it the David Susskind syndrome. I don't know if you're old enough to remember David, but he had a television talk show back in the early 70s, and I got a call from his people when I was living in Southern California. They wanted to do a show on UFOs. There'd been a bunch of sightings. And they wanted an abductee. I got them Betty Hill. Uh, they wanted a recent case, uh, the uh, coin helicopter case in Ohio, where a military crew spotted this UFO uh, fairly close. Uh, they wanted a good skeptic. I said, there aren't any, but uh, here's Phil Class. You can reach him. And they wanted me to send him all kinds of stuff, so I, which I did. They brought me to New York for one day, and in the, the course of taping a show, no live audience, uh, between segments, David says, you know, I read the New York Times. There's nothing in there that leads me to believe there are flying saucers. So the Susskind syndrome is I take great pride in keeping up with what's important in this world. I read the New York Times. You know, I, I do all the right things. And... If this were true, that is, if aliens were visiting Earth and the government was covering up, there's no question that would be an important story. But if it were an important story, I would know about it. And I don't, so it must not be a self-fulfilling prophecy, and I'm not going to waste my time on this nonsense story. So they go on happily with their lives, totally ignoring the big story. And there's even a whole Ph.D. thesis by Dr. Herbert Strentz, Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University about press coverage and how terrible it was of UFOs. So, <clears throat> and I know people who work around Washington. If this were true, I would know about it. I'm important. <laughs> you know? Sorry, that's not how security works. And, you see, that's one of the things I bring to the table here. I worked under security for 14 years. I've been to 20 document archives. I wrote classified documents. I know how security works, and the need to know is paramount. I mean, having enough uh, high, high enough level clearance is important. 
But if you don't have a need to know, you don't get access to the data. Exactly. I was just about to say that about the need to know basis. That's why it was invented. Yeah, it's important. Uh, and, you know, there's also a basic rule for security, which I try to remind people of. You can't tell your friends without telling your enemies because they listen to the radio. They watch television. They read the newspapers. And so uh, people say, well, why can't they tell us? Well, because telling you means they tell everybody. Mm-hmm. I get people who think that the guys on the MJ-12 group, there's a whole chapter about that in the book, uh, must have told their wives. Of course not. They would put everybody at risk. That's not how things work when it comes to security. Stan, tell me, in, in your lifetime, do you think you will see irrefutable existence of alien life here on Earth, where whether they're on TV or the ship lands on the White House lawn or whatever? I'm, I don't know how long I'm going to live, but my parents both live to be 89, so I figure i got quite a few years left, even though I'm a great-grandfather. Uh, that means my grandson had a child. That's not a value. value. <laughs> what kind of a grandfather I am. Uh, I am optimistic, yes, but I think it's probably going to be the result of somebody spending as much effort blowing the lid off the cosmic Watergate as Woodward and Bernstein and the Washington Post did on the political Watergate. Haven't seen any signs of that yet, but maybe. Well, you're certainly, yes, and you're certainly helping to inspire and to inspire others to look into it with the books that you wrote. I want to mention again uh, your books for our listeners, Flying Saucers and Science, A Scientist Investigates the Mysteries of UFOs, Interstellar Travel, Crashes, and Government Cover-Ups. And, of course, that's available in stores everywhere as well as Amazon.com. And we also spoke briefly about your other book, Capture, the story of Betty and Barney Hill, uh, or the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience, I believe it's titled, the full title yep. with Captured, and, of course, many other books. And your Two web- others, two others, Top Secret Magic and Crash at Corona, the Definitive Study of the Roswell Institute. They're all on my website, www.stanfriedman.com. Thank you. I was just about to repeat the website as well. It's been such a pleasure having you on the show today, and I hope you'll come back again and share more uh, information with us. It was wonderful. Hope so. People reading my book will give me more new stories, huh? (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so so much. Thanks. Explore Your Spirit is on the web. Visit us at exploreyourspirit.com. 